there's Fred. Okay, so I am going to now introduce Fred. So we're really excited today uh, to have the topic of the intersection of trauma and gambling. For those of you who've not met Fred, and he's he's there, and what he'll, you'll see him in his little box above his PowerPoint shortly, so you can find him easier. Um, Fred is a licensed professional counselor and a certified gambling counselor, board approved clinical consultant, certified gambling training disorder tra gambling disorder trainer and advanced alcohol and drug counselor. He's provided clinical oversight for the treatment and integration of programs for problem gambling services within the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services in Connecticut since 2014. Prior to his work with Demas, he provided treatment at United Community and Family Services for individuals impacted by gambling disorders and infected love, affected loved ones in Eastern Connecticut in the role of supervisor and clinician of the Better Choice Gambling Treatment Program. Fred was also a clinician in opioid treatment program at Community Substance Abuse Center in Hartford. He obtained his undergraduate degree at Eastern Connecticut State University and his master's degree in community counseling at Fairfield University. Fred is the chair of the National Council on Problem Gambling's Treatment Committee. Welcome, Fred. Colette, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. You've read that better than I would have, so thank you. And I'm sorry that you- a few times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, you didn't have to do all that, but thank you <laughs> for introducing me. And uh, hey, everyone, let me see if I could go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everybody see my PowerPoint? Yes, we can, Fred. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, all. Well, thank you. Uh, looking forward to being here with you for the next hour to talk about the intersection of trauma and gambling. So as Colette said, my name, so I'll go for a couple things with my name. Most people know me as Fred, but my first name is Fiorijo. And it's important for you to know both well, because most people call me Fred. Fiorijo is more challenging. Throughout my life, you know, it was easier for folks to call me Fred. So that's why people know me more as Fred. But if you need to email me, <clears throat> if you need to contact me, you got to know that Fiorijo part because my email address is fiorijo.fed at ct.gov. Because I've had folks that were trying to email me say, Fred, I can't find you anywhere. I'm like, oh, no, you, you got to put Fiorijo in there to find me. So just a little tidbit on, on me there. So the agenda for today, we are going to talk about defining gambling. Uh, and with the group, we're going to talk about different forms of gambling that we see within the state of Connecticut. Uh, talk about some similarities and differences between gambling and substance use disorders. You may be more familiar with substance use disorder as something that co-occurs with trauma. So I want to make the case to show you that there are some similarities and also differences with gambling and substance use disorders. Uh, we'll talk about the intersection of trauma and gambling, uh, have some data on the co-occurring nature, talk about what gambling may look like for somebody that's working with trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm going to introduce you to some evidence-based screening tools that you can use in practice uh, to maybe start asking questions about gambling that you may not be currently doing. And, you know, that's what we often do find, you know, unless you're working with us or working with some of our partners in the field, uh, there might be one question on uh, assessment that you're working with that it's like, ah, do you gamble? Hopefully they don't say yes, because I'm not sure what I'm going to do it next. But we want to assure you that you probably already have a lot of great skills and it's just some new language uh, to introduce into the work. So we'll talk about some of those tools. Uh, we'll talk about some resources within the state and then questions. Now, my approach is flexible. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask any questions. I think the only thing, I'm not sure if I can see the chat with my full screen here. So if anybody has any chat questions or let me ask Sheila, if I close out, oh no, no, does everybody, no, maybe that's not the right way to do it. Um, if you see the chat box, if anybody could just let me know there, that, that would be great. Will yeah, do. We can monitor that and make sure you know if there's questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. And it's important for us to mention that we're neutral on the topic. You know, when we communicate on gambling disorder and problematic gambling behaviors, we often do see some of the negative aspects of it. Um, but we know a lot of people like to gamble. We know most people in our state participate in the behavior. Most can do it at a safe level. 
So we are at a neutral state. We just want folks to be aware that if there are challenges occurring, that there are places that you can get help. And if you choose to participate, participate in a level that's safe. All right, so let's define what we mean by gambling. You know, gambling can be such a broad term. If I was meeting with you all live, it might be a gamble if I hit traffic coming to see you. Uh, it might be a gamble if my dog barks during the course of this presentation. Hopefully st she stays calm, but she likes to ask questions as, as I present. Um, so I think you get my idea. You know, folks can say life can be a gamble. For the purpose of today, we're talking about betting money or material goods with an uncertain outcome in the hopes of winning additional money or material goods. So key points in there. There's uncertainty that's going on here. Um, it's not guaranteed that I'm going to get goods as a result of participating in the behavior. Oftentimes, money is the device that you use to participate in gambling, but it doesn't have to be. So if you think about youth, if you have video games, if you have sneakers uh, that have high value, someone that's incarcerated may have other items that they're using that's not money. So but keep those two points in mind as we talk about gambling. All right, so I'm going to have some chat box questions for the group just to kind of keep you engaged. I have some interactions back and forth with you all if you're okay with that. Uh, so my first is regarding the lottery. So when do you think the lottery began in the state of Connecticut? So 1965, 1971, 1983, 1986. If you could, please put your thoughts in the chat box. Oh, actually, you know what? I can see the chat over here now. I'm sorry, I had to go look above. All right, so Sheila and Colette, I might be able to take that added task off your plate here. Okay, so I see some examples of 1971. Okay, 71. Any other thoughts? A bit about maybe five more seconds. Seventy-one. This is a well-informed group already as we begin. And yes, 1971 is, is the correct answer here. So if we go into a little history lesson on gambling, you know, gambling has been around since early times. Uh, looking at early Egyptian uh, lifestyle and research there, there were primitive dice that were found that were being used at the time. Uh, gambling was used to fund the Great Wall of China, specifically a lottery. And when we think about the lottery and when we think about early America, some of our most prestigious universities were funded by lotteries like Yale and Harvard. Uh, in the early 1900s, there was a lot of concerns regarding gambling behaviors and there was more legislation to prohibit gambling. Uh, as years went on, we look in the 1930s where we've seen the rise of Las Vegas and the casinos there and then the 70s with Atlantic City. The first modern day lottery was established in the 60s in New Hampshire. New Hampshire was the first state to have the modern day lottery. Uh, and Connecticut came on not long after. And, you know, we talk about the lottery because usually when I talk about gambling, the casino is one of the first things that comes to folks' mind. They don't think about some of the different behaviors, but the lottery is a huge form of gambling in our state. Almost 3,000 retailers throughout the state of Connecticut. And games that are offered are scratch tickets, Keno, Powerball. And as I'm talking here, I just want to make a note to folks that may be in recovery here. If you hear any content that's concerning and you need to take a break, please feel free to do that. Because in the beginning part, we'll talk about just forms of gambling in our state, just to educate everyone on, on what is available here. But if you need to take a breather, please feel free to do that. Uh, Last year, gambling was approved to go online and the forms of the lottery being one of the outlets also for sports betting and online casinos. Uh, so later this year, likely late summer, early fall, we will see online draw games and uh, online keno available through the lottery. And to participate in this behavior, you have to be at least 18 years old. Okay, so as I mentioned before, two of the larger establishments where people often connect to gambling are the casinos. So Fox's, Mohegan Sun, they're two of the larger casinos really in the world. Fox's at one time was the largest casino in the world, but now in North America. Started in 1986 with High Stakes Bingo, and then in 1992 came on board as a full casino. Lots of different types of gambling opportunities that are available there. It's open 24-7. Uh, really about 365 days a year. And you gotta be 21 to go into the 
casino establishment as far as the gaming floor, 18 for bingo. Mohegan Sun, also a larger establishment. Similar things that, as we see with Foxwoods, uh, they have a race book there that's available for off-track betting, and that's for individuals that are making decisions to place bets on horse racing, dog racing, and you need to be 21 years old to participate in gambling within that establishment. All right, so our next chat box question. So I mentioned that online casinos were made available last year. Who can operate an online casino in our state? And is it Foxwoods, Mohegan Sun, both Foxes, Mohegan Sun, or Foxwoods, Mohegan Sun, and the lottery? What do you all think? Okay, I see four, so all three. Great, everyone. Thank you for participation. Let's give it about five more seconds if anybody else has any more thoughts. Okay, I am seeing primarily four, but I, I did see an option of three there as well. So the correct answer here is three. So for the online casinos, it is only available through Mohegan Sun and for Foxwoods. Uh, legislative wise are the only two entities that can offer this. Uh, one thing that was made available with this legislation was the ability to use a credit card. You know, certainly brings up concerns as individuals can have challenges with credit card not having a gambling disorder. But one of the things we do see with the online avenue is that there are more responsible gambling tools available that I don't normally see within brick and mortar establishments. So the ability to set limits is something that you can do. The amount of time that you're going to spend in the environment. Uh, deposits that you can put in, the spending that you wager uh, when you're participating in the behavior, and the ability to self-suspend is something that's available as well, meaning that I can stop playing the behavior for three days to up to 30 days. There is also an opportunity to self-exclude, which means that you can stay away from the behavior for one year, five years, or lifetime because you're having concerns with it. But this self-suspension is a lesser opportunity to restrict your access on, on the devices. Okay, so now who can operate online sports betting in Connecticut? So similar responses here. Um, what do you think? Is it one, two, three, or four? What are your thoughts here? Yes, and I, I'm seeing in the chat, yeah, about credit cards. Um, yeah, many major ones can be approved. Yes. And, you know, within our state, we're fortunate that at least it can only be one at a time. So I can't have eight credit cards on that particular set at one time. It can only be one. And, you know, with the potential to restrict the, the issues that can come with the credit card. All right. So we see three here. Okay. So Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun is the most popular choice I see now. Let me give it three more seconds if anybody has a, a final thought. All right, okay, let's go ahead and see. So for this option, it actually is four. So Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun offer online sports, but the lottery within the legislation is able to offer online sports betting as well. So they offer online through their platform of Rush Street Interactive, and they have collaborated with the off-track betting establishments in our state to offer uh, the behavior within 10 of those locations. They have up to 15 to, to be able to offer there, but right now it's within 10. So when we think about sports betting traditionally, you know, betting maybe one team versus another, one individual versus another. What we see in Connecticut and throughout the country really is there are different variables that go into it, different odds. You might have somebody that's favored as an over or an under and different type of prop bets, which means it might not impact what goes on in the game, but I can Think about how many yards Tom Brady may throw in a game, and I could, I could place a bet based on that. Or things like how long the national anthem is going to be, what the coin toss might be. So there's a lot of variety of bets that can occur with sports betting. It's not just one individual or team versus the other. Fantasy sports is something that, that's available as well. And this offers the opportunity to participate in traditional contests where I'm putting – items on the line based on what occurs in real life, but it's a fantasy team. So I might have a quarterback from one team, running backs from another team, and based on what they do in real life predicts what happens with my team. So 
traditionally it goes for the whole season. What, what we have on our platforms in Connecticut is daily fantasy sports, which is a particular contest. So for the NBA's uh, finals, you can create a, a lineup based on that or the hockey playoffs that are going on right now, you can base a lineup on that. So it's not real life what's going on, but real life dictates what happens with those points. So I just want to illustrate that point. Sports betting is traditionally teams versus the others. The others, I'm creating these teams based on real players and their real rewards that happen in life that will affect my team. So esports is another option. So if we think about video gaming, there is an intersection between gaming and gambling there. Now, most of video gaming is not gambling, but there are certain points, points where we can integrate gambling. And for esports, it can be, and it helps if I define what I mean by esports. So it's competitive video gaming. So you may have one team versus another and the winner uh, takes all there. So sporting events are there, but the most popular ones are called mul multiple on online battle arenas, where it's one team versus another and the winner is, is who wins it all. Now, these are so popular with our, our youth. It's a billion dollar industry. Um, on YouTube, Mixer, Twitch, where if you're watching these contests and you're placing a wager on who you think is going to win, now we enter the world of gambling. You know, what we see with esports too, for youth that aren't comfortable going into athletics, like maybe soccer, football, baseball, to gain leadership skills and they have more of an interest in, in the gaming area, they're participating in varsity athletics uh, through here. There are scholarship, scholarships, excuse me, available to colleges that offer esports as an athletic program within their universities. So something to think about there. And one other element to mention here, there are forms of, you know, behaviors, and depending on what state or country you're in, and really in our country, it hasn't been deemed gambling yet, but in Belgium or Netherlands, loot boxes are identified as a form of gambling. So a loot box is an opportunity to open up a chest to get rewards that might help you out in the game. So I might be able to get a a rare weapon that will make me make me do better in the game. Now, the options of getting them, it's very rare. You're more likely to get an item that is more common, but you can spend lots of money to get that type of item. So we're seeing through research that there's more and more similarities to gambling. More and more studies have seen that it shows more gambling behaviors than not. We know of the children that play video games, almost half have opened loot boxes. And revenue that's coming from loot boxes, a majority of it is coming from about 5% of the gamers. Uh, we see men are more likely to participate, our youth. And, you know, I say men because oftentimes we hear video games and we think that it's youth that are participating. But video games are, are around for all age demographics. Uh, the average video gamer is in, in their mid-30s. Uh, so male are participating more. And there's that, you know, fear of missing out that often plays a role in here where you only have this limited time to get this loot box, to get this rare item where more are participating because of that that's going on. Okay, talked a little bit about off-track betting establishments already and their partnership with the lottery for, for sports betting, but just a brief bit of information here. It's overseen by Sports Tech, and there are 15 occurring in the state of Connecticut. All right, so let's think about charitable gaming for a minute. So another chat box question for, for the group. Uh, how old do you have to be to participate in charitable games? Uh, 21, 18, 16, or no age restriction? What do you all think? Sixteen, okay. Eighteen. All right, let's give it five more seconds. Okay, so I, I think I've seen a variety of responses. Um, so the correct response here, let me just close my chat for a second, is four, no age restrictions. So, you know, if you look at the school bingo game, you look at the church raffle, there is no age restriction to participate in charitable games in the state of Connecticut. Um, you know, many youth leagues will have a 50-50 raffle to make money uh, for, for the organization, for the teams that are available. So, you know, although gambling is more of an adult type of behavior, um, and there is risk, just like we see with substance use disorders, when we look at some of the charitable games, there, there are no age restrictions that are available. So what do you think about the stock market? So if we Take a look at that definition, putting something of value, there's uncertainty that's there. So stock market can be a form of gambling. And there is a continuum when we look at the stock market. You know, So if I'm investing in my retirement plan, my 401k, my 457, 
whatever it is that I'm investing in, that's much more low risk. As we know, over time, research has identified that the more you stay involved in it, the more yield you're going to get towards the end. But something along the lines of day trading it is more risky, where I'm, I'm continuously putting money in and out, I'm making changes there's higher likelihood that there's going to be more losses that occur in this type of environment. And we're seeing more popularity with this with apps like Robinhood and cryptocurrency, which is, you know, a new form of currency that's out there. That's a virtual currency. It's very popular, over 9,000 types of virtual cryptocurrency that's out there. Bitcoin being the most popular, but other are really popular as well, such as Dogecoin, Ethereum. And there's even more risk when we look at cryptocurrency. You know, if you look at the stock market for cryptocurrency, what we see now versus what we might see at 11 o'clock, things can vary quickly when we look at cryptocurrency. So we're seeing it as more at risk if folks are participating in this. But the popularity of cryptocurrency continues to, to be more wide known as we're seeing places like iTunes, Burger King, Subway that are accepting cryptocurrency. Now it's important to Note that although there's popularity with cryptocurrency, it doesn't have the same value like a dollar would. So, for example, if I go into Target or if I go into Walmart, if I have a dollar there, it's going to be accepted, but they may not accept cryptocurrency. So not on that same level. And what we're seeing in the intersection of gambling is that there is more risky behaviors. OK, so I'm going to ask you all to have your substance use hat on here as well. Again, it's something that you may see more co-occurring with trauma than gambling, because there are a lot of similarities here. So if I'm working through an alcohol use disorder or if we're just taking alcohol in general, I might be at a level where I'm not using alcohol at all to the severity of an alcohol use disorder. Same thing we're seeing here with gambling. So fortunately, most people can participate in the behavior at a safe level. 95% are there at no gambling social area. Uh, those that meet clinical criteria for a gambling disorder, it's about one to 2% of the population. We're gonna go over the criteria shortly, but for just thinking about those numbers, they may seem small, but if we look at the population of Connecticut, it's about 1% is about 33,000 people. And that's about the population of New London. 2% is about 66, about the population of Bristol. So smaller numbers, but it can impact a lot of individuals. If we look at subclinical problem gambling, which is causing significant distress for the individual, but we're not meeting the DSM-5 criteria for gambling disorder, is double that. And when we think about loved ones that are impacted, uh, anywhere from 8 to 20 can be impacted by problem or gambling disorder. So if we think about that, you know, my family might be impacted as we might not have money to take care of the basic needs. Um, the community could be impacted if I'm embezzling from the church, if I'm embezzling from my employer. We have a lot of individuals that can be impacted by one, one person that's having the challenges with, with gambling disorder. I have professional over there because there are some individuals that can participate at, at a professional level where they're being funded by sponsors to participate in tournaments, but it is more at risk. You know, I, I had worked with individuals in the past that had come into treatment because the gambling for the tournaments was spilling over into gambling at the local casino. It was, it was impacting family members, friends, overall level of functioning. So it has more risk that comes with it, but there are individuals that can participate at that level. If we think about youth, it's double what we see that of the general adult population. If we think about substance abuse, mental health, trauma-related challenges, we're seeing a 10% increase. And then individuals within the criminal justice system, 20 times the rate of that. We see this internationally, nationally. And we did a study a few years back in Connecticut uh, that showed similar results, especially within prisons where people are spending more time incarcerated. So what we do know now is the research has identified that the brain on gambling is similar to the brain on drugs. So the midbrain that's often impacted if we're utilizing a substance is also impacted when we're gambling. Uh, the reward system is impacted or it's, it's uh, affected by the behavior, by the substance. You know, now we're craving more and more of it with tolerance. We're seeing dopamine releases occur as a result of participating in the behavior of taking the drug. Uh, pre prefrontal cortex is weakened where we might see individuals making decisions they weren't before. You know, we've seen many individuals that have never had a criminal justice history before that now have been incarcerated because they were stealing to participate in gambling. Same thing with using drugs where people may not have had issues prior, but under the influence of the substance, they were doing something that was strictly uh, illegal. 
uh, the loss of control, stronger doses, increased bets, uh, preoccupation we're seeing. There's withdrawal symptoms that we see with gambling, uh, feeling restless or irritable if you're unable to participate in the behavior. And overall, repeatedly pursuing negative experiences despite the consequences that are surmounting as a result of the behavior. So let's talk about a few differences. Uh, when we think about gambling, a lot of times there are superstitions, fantasies of success that can go with the behavior. You might see lucky trolls that somebody might use because they had a big win with them before. Or, you know, when I had a win, I was wearing my lucky socks. Uh, even things like songs. You know, if somebody had a big win hearing a particular song, I worked with an individual that anytime that song would come on, that would be a trigger for, for uh, the individual to go over and gamble. Uh, we're seeing unpredictable outcomes. So if I'm using a substance, it's likely I'm going to have an effect when I'm using it. When I gamble, it's not a definitive that I'm going to win every time I gamble. There's that intermittent re reward system, which we've learned through research that it's one of the hardest reinforcement cycles to break. Um, you know, I've had that win and I, I think I'm going to get it again, even though I might have losses that are continuing, the power of that big one and what it does with that dopamine release in the brain is extremely powerful. And it makes it hard to stop the cycle from participating uh, over and over. Gambling is not self-limiting. Where with a substance, my body is going to stop me at one point if I'm taking too much of it. Where gambling, as long as I have that item of value that can keep me participating, I can continue to gamble over and over and over. And even if I was gambling for 48 hours or multiple days, I might look like I'm intoxicated, but we don't have that feature with gambling. We're seeing greater financial problems, not saying that there's not financial problems with substance use because there is, uh, but with, with gambling, money is often like a drug or the most popular device that's used to gamble. So we're seeing significant financial difficulties, especially for individuals that are coming into treatment. Um, less tolerance. We don't have an alternative to incarceration for gambling. Although we continue to work on building awareness within the criminal justice system, we work with CSSD and their training academy. We're looking to work back with the Department of Correction to raise awareness there, um, but certainly not on the same level of parity that we see with substance use disorders. With gambling money, often appears to be that problem, but there are other biopsychosocial factors that occur with gambling, just like with other behavioral health disorders. You know, if I have a loved one is struggling with a gambling disorder, it may make me more at risk. If I have some co-occurring mental health disorders uh, that I'm using gambling to cope with, I'm going to have more, more issues there. What my environment looks like may cause me to gamble. You know, if I'm working through trauma and one of the ways that I cope with it is to gamble, there's different layers that are there. So it may seem like a money-related issue, but there's a lot more that goes into this, just like with other behavioral health disorders. Less public awareness. I feel like where we're substance use was about 20 years ago, uh, where we're not, we're not as well aware of what was going on. I think we're doing, we're trying to move that needle over to more public awareness, but we still have lots of work to do because, you know, even though the research is out there that shows gambling being more like a, an addictive disorder, substance use disorder than not, society in general doesn't see it. You know, we're still at the place where like, well, people should just be able to stop. It's a behavior. Um, you shouldn't be doing doing what you're doing. And I think years ago, we were talking about that for substance use, but now we know that that's not the case. This is a brain disease. It's a lot more that goes into this behavior than just being able to stop and willpower alone. Okay, so this is just some, some slides here that shows, you know, if you're experiencing a, a potential loss, your brain isn't really elevated versus the gains. Now, you know, when my kids were young, they really enjoyed Thomas the Train. Now, there, there's nothing against Thomas the Train. I know my kids loved it. Many people love it. But for me, my brain was likely on the left. You know, the trains, they were always mad at each other. The, the conductor uh, was irritable often. You know, in the first five minutes, I would likely fall asleep. So I, I wasn't getting the gain from there, as others might have. But if I was at the casino at the slot machine and I was experiencing a win, my brain would look more like what we're seeing on the right-hand side. So that gain is coming. It's exciting. Uh, there's a lot of dopamine that gets released as a result of the behavior. And so we know with gambling, it's not just about the win, especially for those that are participating in the behavior at a problematic level. So an example of a near miss, so I have on the slide here, so I, if this is a slot machine here, so if I have a cherry, I have a cherry, I have an almost cherry, but the bar comes out. 
um, what it would look like. And this was a study done out of the UK with those that were having challenges with gambling and those that didn't gamble. Uh, if you had a win, um, or I should say those that really didn't gamble that much problematic level. If you had a win, there was a spike for both the control group and the gamblers. Uh, for the near miss, if you look at the gambler slide, it was almost as high as that spike. So feeling like, oh, you know, it's almost there. And I think, you know, prior to getting involved in this work, I would see that as, oh, yeah, the machine's being warmed up. It's going to hit sometime soon. But the reality with, with slots and with gambling is that this spin is no different than if I had a cherry, a bar, and something else. Um, it's a random number generator, so you can have a win at any point. You just don't know when it's going to happen. So one area doesn't predict what you're going to get in the next, and I think that's important to know with this behavior. Okay, so a little bit more about the DSM. Uh, and actually, before I get to more of the DSM, are there any questions so far on any of the content that I've discussed? Yeah, uh, this is Rosemary speaking. I do have a question. Isn't that the near end, uh, the, the thing that keeps motivating the people to keep on trying? Because I almost got it, but next time I'm going to get it. Is it true to say that? Rosemary, that, that's an excellent point. And I would say yes, you know, there are books that are out there that are showing that, you know, there's this addictive dis design that comes with gambling. I think we know how the human brain can be influenced in this behavior and gambling can exploit that to a degree. You know, we know that fast pace is more addictive than if it's a slower, longer term type of process. Slot machines with Kino, every four minutes you have a game that's occurring. So the behavior can be designed in a way that gets us to continue to participate. The one challenge we see though, is that this can be an addiction. It can cause significant devastation, just like substance use disorders. But yeah, you know, you're absolutely right when you make that comment, Rosemary. So we have to be careful. And one thing I like about some of the new information that's out there now with the online casinos is the limit settings that are there. You know, I want to see us as a society that's more well-informed that if I want to participate in gambling, that up front, I, I'm going to identify what I want to spend. I'm going to identify the limits that I, I'm going to put in place. So I'm making well-informed choices that this is entertainment money. It's not affecting my bottom line. You know, I'm not getting paid and spending all my money on gambling. So that's what I'm hoping that we can move towards. As I said before, we still have a long way to go. And now it's just trying to get individuals to understand that just like drugs and alcohol, this is an addictive behavior. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and any other thoughts or questions so far? All right, let's talk about gambling disorder in the DSM. So the most severe form of gambling has been in the DSM since the early 1980s um, with DSM-3. Prior iterations uh, before DSM-5 had called uh, gambling disorder pathological gambling. And it was within the impulse control disorder, not otherwise specified category. And there were trichotillomania, uh, pyromania, some of these other impulse controls that wasn't as well established in other categories. So it was in this other other category as, as was identified. You know, with the research, some of the brain connections that we're seeing, similarities and criteria, we feel it's in the right spot uh, within the substance-related disorders. Within all other substance challenges, gambling is there. Currently, the only behavioral uh, addiction that's there, but we will likely see others, maybe gaming disorder, when we see the DSM-5 uh, TR that comes out. Uh, uh, earlier versions of gambling disorder had 10 criteria, and our new version, we have nine. Illegal acts was removed uh, for further research as we've had that in prior versions of the DSM. And just quickly to go over the criteria, you may see some similarities. I talked about them earlier when I was talking about um, the similarities on the brain with gambling and drugs, but preoccupation we're seeing, we're seeing tolerance, we're seeing loss of control, withdrawal, gambling to escape with, with challenges, uh, lying about the behavior, chasing losses here. And you know, we hear chasing drugs, chasing substances, here is a little different where we're chasing to try to get made whole, whether it's financially, whether it's emotionally through the behavior, that's what we're seeing with this chase and losses, you know, jeopardizes significant opportunities, jobs, family as a result of the behavior and nearly, excuse me, needing a bailout, someone to loan you money because of the challenges that have been occurred as a result of gambling. If somebody uh, is only gambling in a manic episode, 
uh, and not, let's say I, I meet criteria for a bipolar disorder and I only gamble in the manic episode and not in the depressive state, it's only a part of that uh, more risky behaviors in that manic episode, it would be a rule out. You know, experiences that I've seen, someone was gambling in, in more than one phase, it wasn't just within the manic episode, but that would be a criteria rule out. And within DSM-5, just quickly here, we had additional specifiers, episodic, meeting criteria, but then it's subsiding for at least several months and then coming back at another point. Persistent, continuing for several years. Uh, early remission, sustained remission, we didn't have in the past. That's, that's been common with substance use disorders. Um, and then specifiers, we didn't have that in the past. So mild, moderate, and severe are in DSM-5. So taking that in, into consideration and taking the knowledge you already have with substance use disorders, how many diagnostic criteria do you think are the same as gambling disorder than with alcohol use disorder? What are your thoughts? Three, five, seven, or all nine? Okay, I see five. I see nine. Seven. All right, let's, let's give it about five more seconds. Nine. All right, all wonderful responses. Thank you for your participation. And the correct answer here is five. And, you know, I was surprised by it as well. I thought it would be my, I thought it was seven initially. But if we look at the criteria for alcohol use disorder here, differences in specifier, I won't go through all of them specifically, but within alcohol use disorder, there wasn't an escape criteria, although people may be using alcohol to escape challenges. Uh, there wasn't the lying behavior, although somebody that's struggling with a substance use disorder might be lying. Uh, and chasing and bailouts were, were two different parts uh, that we don't see here. Again, as I mentioned before, there's that chasing element with substance use, but it's not chasing money to be made whole financially or emotionally. And, and here we have them over here. The preoccupation that was the same, tolerance, withdrawal, loss of control, and impacting important aspects of life. All right, so now that we talked a bit about gambling, the behaviors, how it's similar and different from substance use disorders, I wanna take the next several uh, minutes or so to talk about trauma. So first I wanna consider with you all. So when you think about clients you've worked with, um, if you're not specifically within a clinical setting, uh, prevention environments that you may have seen, what are some ways that you've seen individuals cope with trauma? So before treatment or that you've observed in a prevention setting or other setting that I might be missing? Let's, let's take a little, little, maybe a minute or so, however long it takes for you to think about this. I'd like to get some of your thoughts here. Bethany, thank you. Uh, substance use, self-harm. Yes, I mean, I think it's common to hear as substance use as a way to cope with trauma, self-harm as a way to cope with trauma. Jen, thank you. Avoid it, hide it. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that, that's certainly there. I don't want to make others aware of what's going on. I want them to know that I'm struggling with this internally. Lash out. Thank you, Bethany. Isolating from others. Thank you, Latrina. Samantha, spending money, yes, you know, spending money, and it doesn't have to be just gambling, spending money, shopping, uh, feeling better with the products that I'm bringing home. Kelly, thank you, the association, uh, continuing the pattern, abusing themselves, yes, thank you for that. Thank you for your participation. We'll give it about 10 more seconds if you have any additional thoughts that you'd like to include. Yeah, self or over medicating that, that's an excellent point as well. You know, dealing with the challenges, we're seeing some overdoses where individuals might be dealing with trauma through self-medication. Um, absolutely. You know, I, I think I, I've seen a lot of identification of substance use, identification of self-harm that's occurring. And, you know, throughout today and hopefully taking it out into your work, 
to consider that gambling might be something that somebody might use to work through their trauma. So let's, let's talk a little bit about gambling as a solution. So, you know, if, if I'm someone that's working through severe trauma, uh, you know, I'm constantly working through it over and over. If I have that win, could gambling be the solution that takes me away from my trauma? So if I had that big one, you know, we know the value of money is, is so significant in our society. So if I hit that million dollars on the lottery, is that going to be something that's going to take this away from me? Yes, I see over there as a distraction. Yes, you know, this is going to undo it. You know, I could focus on the new things that I want to get, the new home I want to get. And when I'm focused on that, I might not be thinking about the trauma, the challenges that I've had to deal with in my life. Similar with that, the guilt and shame that can go with the trauma experiences. You know, I've, I've had arguments more with my spouse, but if I get that win at the casino, I can come home and my spouse will be happy, uh, be able to pay the bills that we're struggling with, be able to get that car that we always wanted. I'll feel less guilty and shameful for my behavior. You know, I think with the value of money in our society, there can be that invulnerability that comes there. You know, I can't be harmed if I have a lot of money just like I was when I was dealing with other situations, when I experienced my trauma, this will make me feel better. And continued reenactment. So I talked earlier about big wins and that's significant even if you're not experiencing some co-occurring trauma there. So I remember that time when I, I made $10,000 on gambling and you know, I've done it before, I feel like I can do it again. Even though I have hundreds of dollars of losses, I keep thinking about that last time when I had that big win. So seeing that solution, we can see a sense of safety that goes with gambling, where uh, when I'm at the casino, I feel safe. Uh, you know, there's security that's here. I'm not being bothered at my favorite table game that I like to participate in, where at home I might have some challenges. I feel safe when I'm in this environment. And then intensity and aliveness. We've seen this with trauma. We've seen this with older adults as well, where uh, in other aspects of life, uh, having challenges due to physical limitations, not able to do much, but with it, when in the casino, feeling intense, feeling alive, I, I can walk better. I might not need my walker to walk around. Or, you know, when I'm depressed at home dealing with my trauma, when I'm in the casino or when I'm in the off-track betting establishment, I really feel alive. I, I connect with the people there. I connect with the horses. So gambling can be seen as a solution as capacity for those that are working through trauma. We can also see some of the traumatic symptoms, uh, excuse me, some of the gambling losses as traumatic symptoms. So, you know, you can re-experience those big wins, but you can also re-experience those significant losses. You know, not only am I, I dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder here, and now I've put my family in, in more and more debt. I keep thinking about the last time that I had all those losses at the casino. I hope to go back to win, but I just can't stop thinking about all these losses that, that I've incurred. Uh, the increased arousal that we see with, with PTSD, you know, it can only be exacerbated here uh, with the withdrawal that we see with gambling, the irritability, the restlessness that, that can occur, the lack of sleep, because now I'm thinking constantly about my losses as well as my traumatic symptoms. You know, there can be numbing, there can be an absence of emotional responsiveness. One thing I didn't bring up before that I'd like to talk about now is Gambling is one of the addictions most highly correlated with suicidality. Um, so what we're seeing from the DSM reports that those that are in treatment, 50% have had suicidal ideation and almost 20% have, have had a suicide attempt. So we're seeing high levels of this here. And I think I forgot to mention this when I was talking about differences, but this behavior remains hidden a bit more where you can't smell it like if I was using substances uh, you know, we could take a year to capture that somebody's using substances, but we can't take a year and not fall out dice or scratch out tickets fall out of my pockets as I enter the room. It's more hidden. And oftentimes when it gets discovered, it can be at a very helpless state. And just again, the value of money, you know, we can have challenges making ends meet without having a gambling disorder. But if you add thousands upon thousands of dollars of debt onto that, it can help us to understand the helplessness. You know, I know anecdotally, I saw it in my work. I, you know, when I was doing substance-related work and, and prior mental health-related work, 
I did work with suicidal ideation, but I saw a lot more of it when I was working with individuals having challenges with problem gambling and gambling disorder. Initially, I was surprised, but when I pulled it back a little bit more and thought about the hidden nature, the helplessness that comes with it, it helped me to realize it a bit more. Uh, the de derealization, depersonalization, you know, and I think we can see this more and more with our current element of gambling. So if I'm in the casino environment, I'm not using my real money, I'm using chips. Uh, with the online world, I have the credit card that's out there. It might be credits that I see in front of me on the screen. It's easier to see it as nothing real. And now if we add challenges of trauma onto that, we see just additional challenges that go with the behavior. And then in the day's autopilot, I saw the association, uh, so, uh, Bethany, I thought so you had brought that up in the chat. That can be common here as well. You know, I've worked with clients that had utilized the slot machine as a way to dissociate. So I experienced all these years of trauma in my life, but when I'm playing the slots, I'm not thinking about that. I'm focused on my game. I'm in the days, I'm on autopilot, I'm in the zone with this behavior. So some things to think about uh, regarding gambling and co-occurring trauma. So I wanna go over some, some data here, talk about resources, and, and then we'll head over to, towards the end of the presentation with final questions. But you know, we know the ACEs is a more popular assessment that's being used in, in behavioral health settings. You know, you know, if we meet more ACEs, we have likelihood to meet other behavioral health disorders, and that's not any different with gambling. Um, so according to the study here by pool, individuals that had met three or more ACEs were more than three times as likely to report disordered gambling. Bethany, that, that's an excellent point I see in the chat over here, you know, well, at least I'm not using and yes, you know, as we see gambling, I know we, we didn't talk about substance use and gambling data today, but there is, but we talked about it a little bit, about 10 times higher. We do see a higher correlation. You know, there's individuals that have been in recovery from other substance use disorders, and now gambling is providing that relief. You know, I certainly saw that in clinical practice. Uh, but it can, because of the stigma that goes with this, it can be seen as a lesser concern. Well, yeah, you know, I'm not using alcohol anymore, so what I gamble every now and then. It's not causing me challenges there. And when we work with some of our integration programs, we try to see what role this plays in your recovery. Okay, so listen, we don't have to necessarily take this away. We can look at a harm reduction approach, whatever works for you. You know, we utilize a lot of motivational interviewing in our work as well. But let's identify what role this plays in your recovery. Does it help your recovery? Does it hinder it? Let's have that conversation and explore what's going to be best for you in your recovery. So looking at some connections with intimate partner violence and child maltreatment, uh, th this study uh, here from 2009 had shown for those that are, were struggling with problem and, you know, gambling sort of a pathological gambling as it was referred to before 2013, um, <clears throat> there was increase of dating violence, uh, six to 12 times greater. Uh, severe marital violence was much higher. Severe child abuse was, was much higher. So, I mean, I think looking at this, so if you're working with individuals that are dealing with intimate partner violence and um, some child abuse, it's important to assess for gambling as well. Uh, just a, another study along similar lines. Um, for those that were having challenges with problem gambling, more than half uh, reported being a perpetrator of violence or being the victim of intimate partner violence. More than half had clinically significant anger. You know, and as we see with other conditions, as there's more and more co-occurrence, we're likely seeing more impacts. And the study had found that as well. So pres uh, presence of lifetime substance use disorder with anger and problem gambling increased the likelihood of intimate partner violence. I wanna look at a few studies regarding gambling, trauma, and veterans. Uh, this study was done with um, veterans that were coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq. And looking at those that had gambled, uh, you know, for men, more than half had gambled in the past year, a little under half for women. Um, and I want to highlight a few other areas. If we go down a little bit where it says began before age 18, like with substance use disorder, the earlier we're participating in the behavior, the more problematic it could be later on in life. And that's the same thing we see with gambling. So almost everyone had gambled before age 18. You know, and looking closer at the data, it was really almost everybody was before the age of 11. And when we look at some of the symptoms, you know, the PPG over there is probable pathological gambling based on the tool they use the South Oaks gambling screen here. 
And if we think about the one to 2% of the general population uh, for women, it was 5% for men, almost 18%. So much higher numbers of correlation of gambling uh, within the veteran sample here that was looked at. And two more here with, with gambling and veterans. So the first one was veterans that were in treatment for gambling disorder. So looking at the sample there, 42% had confirmed diagnosis of PTSD. And, you know, one of the things we see within the military is if you go overseas, that there are slot machines on bases. So, you know, for some of the downtime for veterans, this might be a behavior they're participating in. And if it's something that they're having challenges with, you know, dealing with some of the trauma they're experiences, experiencing, it's important to have some help available. And we see gambling really as a stigma with veterans as well as, you know, fear to talk about this as a behavior because it might affect my clearance uh, based on this affecting the judgment that I have. Um, so it can be more of a barrier to getting uh, further into one's career if they talk about gambling as, as a concern. And then the, the last study here, um, just some of the high rates of, of emotional trauma, physical trauma and sexual trauma for those veterans that were in treatment for, for a gambling disorder. Any questions uh, on the data of gambling and trauma? Okay, everyone. So now we're heading more towards the end here. I wanna just talk about some resources. Oh, I should know one more thing before resource. I'm sorry. I wanna talk about the, the screening tools. So if, you're interested in, in screening more for this. I think what the data is telling us is that we're seeing higher prevalence. So if we could talk about this more, it might help to uncover something that could be underlying and a co-occurring behavior that could be just worsening some of the conditions that, that your clients are having. So what I would encourage, instead of asking a question like, do you gamble, ask something like this. So in the past year, have you participated in any of the following? You know, we've talked with providers throughout the state that have said that, Fred, if I just bring up gambling, that's seen as stigma. And uh, they've just talked about the gambling type of behaviors. And I think that's perfect. And we've adapted that as well. So have you participated in the following? Talk about the different gambling behaviors in our state and then offer options here. So no, not nothing at all. Less than monthly, monthly, weekly, or daily. If somebody responds anything other than none, you can ask further questions. So the brief biosocial gambling screen is one of the more popular brief uh, evidence-based tools in our field now, more of a clinical tool. And you can ask questions about the restless criteria that we talked about before, lying and bailouts. Um, you know, what I would suggest if somebody says, yes, the tool indicates that um, someone's likely to meet a score for gambling disorder if they say yes to one of the three questions, but to screen even further to ask the questions on the DSM-5. But this is a tool that can be implemented into an intake. For those that are doing prevention work, that are doing uh, assessments in the community or work in the community, the PGSI or the Problem Gambling Severity Index is a great tool. Uh, ask questions over the past uh, 12 months and nine questions to assess where the individual is. Is this not problematic at all? Low, moderate, or, or problematic gambling behaviors. Okay, you know, I don't know if we're gonna have time to show this video. I'm gonna leave this as a resource. I sent my slides uh, to Sheila. Sheila, you have my permission to send them out to anybody that's interested. Uh, this is just a two minute video on what we oversee and do within our problem gambling services division of Demis. Um, so our web address is there, are lots of resources areas to find our Better Choice Gambling Treatment Programs and assessments, screens, anything of interest you can find on, on there related to right, problems. You have time to show it. Oh, I do? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, I just want to leave time for questions. Okay, everyone. So here's a You're little good. overview of Problem Gambling Services here.
collaborating with the Gambling Awareness Chiefs and each of the state's regional behavioral health action organizations, offering training on gambling-related topics and ensuring initiatives follow the strategic prevention framework and are research-based and data-driven. The Gambling-Specific Treatment Program in Connecticut are called Better Choice and offer outpatient, individual, group, and family counseling services, as well as a connection to recovery support specialists with lived experience, all at little to no cost. The Disordered Gambling Integration Program, or DIG-IN, recognizes that gambling disorders go hand in hand with substance use and mental health disorders, and ensures problem gambling is a relevant topic in treatment. DIG-IN supports providers to include problem gambling in their screening, assessment, and treatment programs. Help is available for individuals and families struggling from problem gambling. Reach out. For more information or to contact Problem Gambling Services, please visit our website at www.ct.gov slash dmhas slash pgs. All right, thank you, Colette. All right, so some additional resources on so the video to talk about our Better Choice Gambling Treatment Program. So these are our programs that offer gambling specific care for individuals and persons that are affected. So each of the regions of the state has a Better Choice provider and they're similarly to what you would see with our traditional DEMAS outpatient programs. Uh, there's individualized treatment, group, uh, family counseling, to meet the need of the individual. Groups are, I see I said groups, groups are available. Um, psychiatric services are available. We do offer our programs funding as money. It, we don't want that to be a barrier for folks to come in. As you know, as I talked earlier, the significant debt that comes into treatment for somebody that has some high co-pays, our insurance deductibles, um, they can come in at, at little to no cost for treatment. And uh, one of our programs, MCCA offers some inpatient care. It's uh, embedded within their substance use treatment program. Uh, they have five days to up to 30 based on the need of the individual uh, for that inpatient care. You know, if you've been interested in some of this work here and want to work on, on a regional collaborative with, with gambling work, we have our gambling awareness regional teams at the website listed here, uh, which brings folks, treatment, prevention, recovery, stakeholders within the community together uh, see a lot of great network and collaboration that occurs, especially in March, which is Problem Gambling Awareness Month. This past year, we had numerous events to learn more about the behavior. And a lot of that came with the effort of the regional teams, our partner, the Connecticut Council on Problem Gambling and our Better Choice Network. Uh, the Connecticut Council on Problem Gambling's helpline is one of the most popular ways that people will find uh, treatment. You know, I looked at our our treatment referrals over the past several years, and this continues to be the, the top uh, referral resource. So you can connect by phone, by chat, and by text. And then just final resources before we take final questions. Uh, just like 12-step groups for alcohol, for um, substances, we do have 12-step groups for gambling. Gamblers Anonymous is available, and Gamanon is available for loved ones impacted. Uh, within all our gambling treatment programs, we have recovery support specialists, but we also have a statewide recovery support services. Um, Stephen Matos oversees it, um, and it helps with getting peers additional um, education through CCARS Recovery Coach Academy, through um, Advocacy Unlimited's Recovery University. A speakers bureau is, is offered and available there. He offers presentations to different programs throughout the state, so a good resource within our state. We partner with CCAR through our, and the video talked about our disorder gambling integration effort, and they're working on integrating gambling into the recovery community centers and other efforts. And then just a site for the National Council on Problem Gambling for additional resources. All right, everyone, four minutes left. I'm done with my presentation. Do you have any questions? Please let me know. And there's my contact information if you need any questions to 